All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our sixth edition BCBA task list series. We are continuing experimental design with single case experimental designs and the defining features. In ABA, we primarily use single case designs in both research and practice because it helps us focus on the individual. When you think about classic psychology, typically group designs are used where we're comparing one or more groups to another a lot of times you have a control group who, who aren't receiving any intervention. We don't typically use that style of research in ABA. We like to give every subject the intervention and examine how the intervention affects the individual rather than the group. Now, I don't think because you aren't in a research position that you don't use single case designs. Pretty much any time you're going to use an intervention with, let's say, a clinical client of yours, this is what the process is going to look at. That client will be their own control. You're going to repeatedly measure it, and you're going to predict, verify, and replicate. As always, check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout-out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. So what are single-case experimental designs? They're research methods that focus on the individual subject rather than the group. And that's the, the easiest way to explain it. When you think of many research methods, right? Typical psychology research methods. We're looking at groups. So we have group A and group B. A lot of times group B will be the control where group A gets the intervention, group B doesn't, and then we compare. With single case designs, the individual is their own control, meaning we're looking at the individual's behavior change rather than looking at the group as a whole's behavior change. And this allows us to establish a better functional relationship between our independent independent variable for the individual. And if you think about typical ABA practice with people with autism, it makes a lot of sense because we work on an individual basis for the most part. So we wanna know how are we affecting that particular client rather than let's say every client in our group. We can, we can look at detailed analysis of individual behavior change rather than group averages. Again, how is the behavior of the individual changing rather than a group of 20, let's say. And through this analysis and data collection, we can make ongoing database decisions rather than waiting to make database decisions, right? With repeated measures, since we're looking at the individual behavior, we can make these changes quickly and our decision-making is always evolving. And again, it's our primary design used in ABA. We use visual analysis for the most part with single case designs as opposed to a standard statistical analysis. So what are the advantages and applications of our single subject design? We can look at clinically significant information about individual clients. So if you have a caseload of 12 clients, each client's gonna be different. And with single subject designs, we can really get down to what makes each individual client different. How do they respond to interventions? If you ran a group design with those 12 clients instead, well, you'd get a group average and you could see how the group's affected, but individual clients, we wouldn't have clinically significant information about each one. So it allows us to focus more on the individual. We can be flexible and we can be responsive because data collection is always ongoing and evolving. It helps us remain ethical. When we think about, let's say, a standard group study, again, A, a group, B group. Well, A might get the independent variable, the intervention, if B is the control group, they aren't getting that intervention. If you think about a medical study where group A receives the experimental drug and B gets a placebo, if the drug works, then that's great for A. Group B got a placebo, they didn't actually get the drug. So how is that ethical in ABA? Well, in this case, we don't have a group receiving positive reinforcement and a group not, for instance. Everybody or all the people involved, all the individuals involved are actually receiving the treatment or intervention. And then it can bridge the gap between research and practice because as we know, we take all this research that is done and we apply it to our real life settings. And through individual research, we can start to use interventions based on individual success rather than group averages. Now, first, individuals serve as their own controls. What does that mean? Well, rather than comparing different groups, we look at an individual's performance under different conditions. So that's your standard, think about it this way, 
standard reversal, right? You have baseline, intervention, baseline. And we're looking at participant A, right? This is participant A. So instead of thinking about it where we have a whole group and we're comparing groups, how does this individual's performance change? The baseline is kind of our control condition, right? Nothing is changing. No intervention is active. And then our intervention, we'll see, okay, how has it changed? And then back to baseline. This kind of eliminates between subject variability. So if we have a lot of different clients and we're looking at the averages, well, all those clients are different. That can kind of obscure the effects of the treatment if someone responds better or worse. Our participants' characteristics remain constant, meaning if there's something unique about that participant, that's not going to change across these phases because it's the same client and we're comparing the client to themselves rather than other people who may be different than them. And then no separate control group, one, making it ethical, and two, making it practical. So let's take an example. We're measuring the frequency of tantrums for two weeks without intervention. That's our baseline, our control. Then we measure it against, again, during a behavior plan, which is our intervention. And we're comparing the control baseline to when the intervention was active. How does the behavior change? Repeated measures over time. Data are collected continuously and systematically throughout all phases of the study, meaning we are always collecting data no matter what phase we're in and continuously. We're using multiple measurements to look at patterns and detect changes. So when we think about trends and levels and variabilities, this is what we're talking about. We get a detailed picture of all those through repeated measures. Multiple data points increase confidence in observed effect, and it allows researchers to see when behavior changes occur relative to intervention. If we only took data every three weeks, well, we're missing a lot of information. By continuously taking data, we can actually see when behavior is changing relative to the intervention or maybe even an environmental change. So let's say we record the number of math problems a student completes correctly every day for 30 days across baseline intervention and maintenance. Well, that's gonna give us so much more information than just testing before and after intervention one time, right? That continuous repeated measurement provides a much clearer and more detailed picture of the client and behavior change rather than a single test before and after we actually try to change behavior. And then prediction, verification, and replication, sometimes called baseline logic, right? These are essential to help establish functional relationships. Prediction involves establishing a pattern of responding to a baseline, and then we forecast what happens if conditions are unchanged. So for example, if this is our baseline phase, and we have baseline here, our prediction might be without intervention, baseline continues. Verification demonstrates that changes in behavior occur only and only when the intervention is applied. In other words, we need to verify if that if we never intervened, our baseline would remain changed. So if we intervene here and base behavior goes up, to verify our prediction, we need to reverse that, right, and look back at baseline. And then replication, we're replicating that intervention multiple times to make sure it's us controlling the behavior and strengthen that functional relationship. So in a perfect world, you predict baseline remains unchanged, you verify it through reversal or other means, and then replicate that intervention. So these defining features work together to establish experimental control. We're looking at a functional relationship. We're looking at experimental control. We're trying to see that we are controlling our client or individual's behavior through our intervention. So prediction plus verification plus replication equals more or less experimental control. We're looking to rule out extraneous variables and confounds, and then we can make determinations about the individual with confidence. All right, thanks for watching. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com. We are pumping these videos out as quickly as possible. Yes, we are doing the entire task list. Be sure to subscribe so you get all of these video updates. Like our videos, it also helps. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout-out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.